Welcome to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. On today's program, I'll share excerpts with you from an event that I had the honor of hosting earlier this spring. It was a Project Censored KPFA-sponsored event where we welcomed Aviva Chomsky. Her talk about her recent book, Central America's Forgotten History, Revolution, Violence, and the Roots of Migration. On today's Project Censored show, I'll share excerpts of that fascinating talk that Aviva Chomsky gave April 29th, earlier this year, as part of the KPFA Spring Fun Drive. Stay tuned for an hour with Aviva Chomsky today for the KPFA Fun Drive. Think of time, think of all crimes perpetrated by the criminal minds with political ties, habitualized alibis, skies and other guys, of democracy, politics, and the apocalypse. Got the skies like an ominous. Welcome to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. Earlier this spring, April 29, I had the honor of hosting Professor Aviva Chomsky. Her most recent book, Central America's Forgotten History, Revolution, Violence, and the Roots of Migration. This timely talk was a Zoom event sponsored by KPFA and Project Censored. Again, I hosted the evening, and Aviva Chomsky gave a talk for well over an hour and did Q&A afterwards with our audience. On today's Project Censored show for the Spring Fun Drive, I'm sharing excerpts of that amazing talk with you, and you're able to get a copy of that event for pledging your support to KPFA Today, special thanks to our producer, Anthony Fest, for putting together our fun drive shows as he puts together all of our shows. But today, again, a little more effort goes into these. We're sharing fascinating excerpts of this talk with you. But also, I'll interrupt on occasion to remind you of why we're here. We're here at KPFA so that you can hear people like Aviva Chomsky or last week like historian Claudio Sant. People who receive accolades within their professions and are known within certain communities, certainly activist and social justice communities, but they're not necessarily people that are household names. They're certainly not people that you'll see or hear in the corporate news media, even over at NPR or PBS. So for today's program, while we're sharing excerpts of Aviva Chomsky's fantastic talk, Central America's Forgotten History, Revolution, Violence, and the Roots of Migration, You'll be reminded that these are things that we should be thinking about, things you should be hearing about on the news. But often, if you're only tuned to the corporate media, you're not. So please call during the hour, 800-439-5732, 800-439-5732, or pledge securely online at kpfa.org. I'll check in with you in a little while and remind you of the wonderful things that we have to offer But for now, let's get to that talk. Aviva Chomsky restores the region's fraught history. We're talking about Central America, a history of repression and resistance to popular consciousness and connects the United States interventions and influence to the influx of refugees seeking asylum today. Well, at the center of the current immigration debate are migrants from Central America fleeing poverty, corruption and violence in search of asylum in the United States. In Central America's forgotten history, Aviva Chomsky answers the urgent question, how did we get here? She outlines how we often fail to remember the circumstances and ongoing effects of Central America's historical inequality and oppression, a direct result of colonial and neocolonial development policies and the cultures of violence and forgetting needed to implement them. And now we turn to this talk from Aviva Chomsky. Central America's Forgotten History. Please welcome Professor Avi Chomsky. Thank you so much, Mickey. Thank you, everyone, for being here. So I thought I would start out by telling you why I wrote the book and then talk to you a little bit about what's in the book, what I argue, and then connect it to some of the things that our president and vice president have been talking about over the past two weeks or so, because of course, I didn't know when I wrote it, how timely it was going to be when it came out, but it turned out to be quite timely. I teach Latin American history and I work on immigration. As you know, I've published several books on immigration. One of the main things that I feel like there's such huge memory gaps 
And one of the ones that I feel with my students is during the 1980s, I was in Berkeley and the Central American revolutions and the U.S. policy towards Central America were so overwhelming in our political consciousness of those of us who, and not only in Berkeley, I think um, on many campuses around the country and not only on campuses, our opposition to U.S. policy, our analysis of why the United States did what it did, but also our sense of hope in the revolutions of Central America were just so central to my formation and to the formation of so many people who I knew. And it seems like so much of that has disappeared down the memory hole. If I want to mention the massacre of the Jesuits at the Central American University in 1989, or the assassination of Archbishop Romero, or the Nicaraguan Revolution, my students don't know what I'm talking about. All of those things have just been erased. And even my students from Central America, and I have many students from Central America, most of them say their parents never talk to them about why they came here, about the wars, about the revolutions, about the histories of their own countries. I teach a course on Central American history, and of course I teach on Central America in my Latin America courses. But another reason that I wrote this book is that I found it very hard to find something to assign to teach Central America. Back in the 1980s, 1990s, there was a proliferation of books aimed at general audiences that tried to explain what was going on in Central America. Since the 1990s, there's been a proliferation of scholarship but it's been very scholarly scholarship and not the kind of thing you can recommend to a friend or assign in a class necessarily. And I found that when I wanted a general book, I was going back to things that were published in the 1980s and 1990s. And of course, did not tell us, incorporate all of the new scholarship or tell us about what has been happening since the 1990s or connect those revolutions of the 1980s to today's migration. So that was something that I really had in mind when I started writing this book. Another thing is the extent to which I feel Central America's history is here in the United States right now, and yet invisible to most outsiders, people who are outside the Central American immigrant community. People who lived through the war, war criminals, it's all being played out in communities like Lynn, Massachusetts, and Providence, Rhode Island, in Guatemalan communities, in Salvadoran communities. And there's been several cases in the last three or four years of sensational arrests of well-known war criminals from El Salvador and Guatemala, people who were living quiet, invisible lives as landscapers or cooks, in, in cities around the United States, invisible, at least to the non-Central American U.S. public, very well known in their communities frequently as to who they were. So, so much of the drama that we read about and heard about in the 1980s, it's not over and it's happening in our cities and towns around the United States today. Finally, I wrote the book because people have been talking about immigration I've been talking about immigration. And if you listened to our vice president speaking with the president of Guatemala, she said, finally, we're going to address the root causes. And President Biden has also been talking about addressing the root causes of immigration. And she listed many of the causes that I talk about in my book. In fact, she could have even been referring to the title of my book. She talked about poverty, violence, corruption, she used the term roots. I used the term roots. She talked about climate change and its effect, drought, hurricanes. But she stopped there. That is, she didn't talk about the causes of all of those things. In the minds of our political leaders, poverty, violence, corruption, climate change, those are all just facts of life that don't require explanation. What I want to do in my book is explain why is Central America so poor? Why is there so much violence? Why is there so much corruption? What are the causes of climate change? So I wanted to go well beyond what our political leaders seem to think of as the roots to talk about what are the roots of those roots. So of course, I need to do that by looking back through history. And 
really, I feel that the histories of the United States and Central America are so intertwined over the last at least 150, 200 years that it's hard to even disentangle them to talk about, well, what is the United States without Central America and what is Central America without the United States? So I thought I would read to you just a page or so of the book where I delve into that argument, which is really at the heart of the history that I go through. So it's a section that begins on page 40, in case you have a copy of the book, called Tangled Histories, Colonialism and Progress. And I put progress in quotation marks. As Central American elites sought to build their nations in the decades after independence, Many saw the United States as their model, and the Central American countries obtained independence in the early 19th century through a process that began. They were originally part of Mexico and then broke off from Mexico as the United Provinces of Central America, and then the countries that we know of as the Central American countries split out of the United Provinces of Central America. So by the end of the 1830s, the countries as we know them today, more or less, had become independent. Like their U.S. counterparts, Central American government and economic power holders believed that Indians were an obstacle to progress and modernity. And remember, of course, that when the United States became independent, it was a small strip along the East Coast, and that one of the causes of the movement for independence in the United States was the fact that the British colonizers, who we euphemistically tend to call colonists, as if they weren't colonizers, but they were colonizers, the British colonizers who led the struggle for independence in the United States were angry because the British crown was putting limits on white settlement and on white settler expansion. So, Unlike practically every other anti-colonial revolution, the U.S. anti-colonial revolution was a revolution fought by the colonizers themselves. It was not fought by the colonized people, Native Americans, African Americans. It did not expel the colonizers. It gave more power to the colonizers because it removed the restraint that the British crown had placed on the colonizers. So that independence was followed immediately by more colonialism, more colonial expansion, and the United States expanded from this small strip along the East Coast to cover the entire continent. So seeing Indians as an obstacle to progress and modernity is something that Central American elites shared with the colonizers of the United States. But... For the United States, Central America as a whole embodied the political and economic backwardness they attributed to Indians and sought to overcome by U.S.-imposed progress. For the United States, Central America represented an extension of the American West, a land inhabited by savages that had to be subdued. Quote, that the stewardship of the more civilized United States would benefit these savages, whether or not they recognized it, were points of such impressive consensus that from the mid 19th century onward, the border ceased to have much meaning when it came to determining the national interest and the right to pursue it, explained historian Matthew Fried Jacobson. Bolivar, the Latin American independence leader, had warned of the threat of direct US intervention in Latin American affairs. Less visibly, but perhaps just as insidiously, the United States example infiltrated the minds of elite Latin Americans who were trying to build nation and state, as well as poor majorities who labored for elites in the export economies for subsistence or for access to the consumer goods that came to symbolize U.S. prosperity for many. Comparing their own realities unfavorable, unfavorably to the U.S. example, Some sought to mimic or adopt U.S. ways. Central American elites often invited U.S. economic or even military intervention in pursuit of their own goals. They taught their children English and sent them to study at U.S. institutions. Some also resented U.S. racism, blamed U.S. imperialism for their country's problems, and fought against it. 
William Walker's 1855 invasion of Nicaragua spurred a violent and united rejection and a long memory. It also, quote, paradoxically strengthened elite Nicaraguans' infatuation with the U.S. road to modernity, according to historian Michel Gobat. With the gold rush traffic, Nicaragua, quote, eagerly adopted a wide array of new U.S. goods and cultural practices, as well as U.S. ideals of technological progress and enterprise. But Walker also brought, quote, a highly exclusionary and bellicose strand of U.S. manifest destiny that claimed Latin Americans could not be Americanized through the civilizing force of U.S. culture and trade, but had to be violently subordinated, if not physically exterminated. The much longer U.S. occupation of Nicaragua between 1912 and 1933 had similarly paradoxical effects. The occupation brought bankers and Protestant missionaries, as well as Marines. Nicaraguan elites aspired to the kind of capitalist progress and national strength that the United States seemed to embody. But by taking over Nicaragua's finances and challenging the Catholic Church, occupiers unsettled the power of these same elites and turned many of them against the occupiers. Central America's governing elites thus juggled adherence to European and white supremacist ideas, idealization of U.S. versions of progress that required eliminating or assimilating their own indigenous populations, and nervous resentment against U.S. arrogance that lumped all Central Americans into the, quote, savage category. Tensions over the nature of their countries and their relations with the United States were deeply racialized. Would Euro-descended Central American elites identify with the indigenous majorities of their countries in challenging U.S. colonial attitudes and structures? Or would they ally with U.S. power holders who identified Indians and Central Americans in general as backward threats that needed to be exterminated, either literally or culturally through assimilation into Euro-dominated culture? You're listening to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. We're playing excerpts today of a talk given April 29th by Professor Aviva Chomsky. I had the honor of hosting Professor Chomsky that evening for a KPFA Zoom event co-sponsored by Project Censored. She was discussing her latest book, Central America's Forgotten History, Revolution, Violence, and the Roots of Migration. This is the KPFA Spring Fun Drive, and I am cutting in to that speech by Professor Chomsky to remind you that you can support this radio station, Community Radio KPFA, been around for over 70 years, and it fills a void in our media culture. You listeners all know that. We need to raise over $450,000 in this drive to keep the lights on, to keep the programming coming and to be a viable media platform that, well, you come to to hear the news that didn't make the news, as Project Censored's been saying since 1976. KPFA has this kind of original programming that you won't hear any other place. So call now, 800-439-5732. That's 800-HEY-KPFA. You can pledge securely online at kpfa.org. The $150 mark gets you the KPFA live video events, of which this talk was part with Professor Aviva Chomsky. Last week, I played for you excerpts of another talk that I hosted with Claudio Sant, who had just recently won the Bancroft Prize. So we've been playing excerpts from these amazing talks and you could get them all from the spring series that was Sister Solja, Martin Espada Michael Eric Dyson Claudio Sant and Aviva Chomsky Greg Grandin, Vivian Gornick Jeff Chang and Davey D by calling 800-439-5732 now $150 pledge gets you the whole pack of KPFA live video events limited number of tickets available for this one $500 You can get the Magical History Boat Tour. You can join East Bay Yesterday host Liam O'Donohue on the evening of July 10th for a journey through centuries of Bay Area history. This is the $500 pledge, limited number of tickets available. So call now if that interests you in the Bay Area. 
800-439-5732. That's the number to call. You can also, uh, again, go to the kpfa.org website and go to uh, the link of all of the premiums there. And you can see the Malcolm X Digital Collection. You can see the special COVID items, the, the emergency radio, these types of things. That's all available. You could go to kpfa.org and you could pick out your thank you gift. But the important thing is, is that you call now and pledge now so that you can go and get that gift. 800-439-5732. KPFA been around since 1949 with the goal of promoting peace, both interpersonal and international by means of ethical, intellectual, and artistic integrity. KPFA has remained ever vigilant since then thanks to the generosity and support of our listeners. That's you. So please consider making that donation today. 800-439-5732 and give the gift that gives back to the community. And that's you. That's the cost of independence and that comes directly from you. KPFA.org, 800-439-5732, the number to call. $150 $150 gets you the special pack of all the speeches from this spring, including Aviva Chomsky, which I'm sharing with you today. Any amount that you donate, $25 to be a member of the KPFA family, that gets you membership. But any amount, any donor at any rate gets telling the story. That's KPFA's thank you gift to donors at all levels during this spring fund drive. It's the Telling the Story audio pack. It includes a digitized event with Angela Davis, titled A Lifetime of Revolution from 2015. It also includes a two-part interview with Al Young. You know, and I heard part of this the other day and I was reminded about how brilliant Al Young was, former poet laureate at California, the late great Al Young, friend of KPFA, just passed away this April at the age of 81. And this enlightening interview was conducted by Jack Foley back in 2002. And they've also added a couple more. There's a fantastic talk here by Edward Said. The idea of Palestine, very timely right now. Well, you can get this talk by Edward Said from 1982. And that's for any level. Any level that you can donate right now, you get this special telling the story thank you gift. 800-439-5732. That is the number to call. I'm going to return right now to our speech by Professor Aviva Chomsky. April 29, I got the host of an event with her. She's talking about her new book from Beacon Press. Central America's Forgotten History, Revolution, Violence, and the Roots of Migration. We're going to go back to that talk now, but please keep the calls coming. 800-439-5732, kpfa.org. And now, back to Professor Avi Chomsky. I want to go over three, well, maybe four, three waves of U.S.-sponsored economic development in Central America, starting in the 19th century with the revolutionary interlude of the post-World War II period, and look at how they built on each other and brought us to where we are today, in particular with the question of migration. So the first period I look at grows directly out of the quote that I just read, that is the late 19th century formation of what we could call the coffee and banana states of Central America. The period after independence was one of U.S. intervention, civil war, but by the late 19th century, we have state consolidation on this export-oriented model of coffee in the Pacific Highland regions of Central America under the control of Spanish-descended and other European immigrant elites, and bananas on the Atlantic coast of Central America, in particular Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, although I don't focus much on Costa Rica in the book, under the control of the United Fruit Company. So every country except El Salvador, which has no Atlantic coast, had a strong U.S. influence in the Atlantic region. The United Fruit Company tended to be the largest landholder in the country and established the sort of model of industrial agriculture, bringing migrant workers both from the British West Indies and indigenous people from the highlands to form a sort of a state within a state on the Atlantic coast. And there were a couple of other US fruit companies. They all ended up consolidating. 
But the Central American states themselves were more coffee states than banana states. That is, the elites who formed the states represented the coffee producers. Now, in order to produce coffee, they needed two things. They needed land and labor. And this is where indigenous people came in. That is, just as progress and expansion in the United States required the dispossession of indigenous populations, Central America's coffee states also required land. That meant the dispossession of indigenous populations. And it required labor, which meant the extraction of labor from indigenous populations through a number of different types of forced labor systems. All of this required a great deal of violence. So these states were highly militarized states forming police force after police force in the interests of dispossession and labor compulsion. So the very origins of these states, like those of the United States, but subordinate to the United States. So the banana industry was completely controlled by the United States. The coffee industry less so, although increasingly the United States was the main market for the coffee and increasingly took over these countries' finances. So while the coffee growers themselves were not Americans, the coffee grower economy shifted its magnetic north from Europe to the United States over the course of the end of the 19th and into the 20th century. So it was a state that was highly repressive and exploitative, but extremely profitable. And all of the political leaders adopted this ideology of order and progress. That was kind of the slogan of Latin America's 19th century dictatorships, that the indigenous populations had to be subdued, they had to be dispossessed, and they had to be coerced into labor in order for the countries to progress along the lines in the section that I was reading. And state-sponsored European immigration was also part of this model to try to whiten the population. Now, of course, the United States was doing the same thing in the 19th century, excluding migration from non-white countries and promoting immigration from European countries in order to populate this lands that were being taken over and develop the economy. So a very particular racialized view of progress. The United States also intervened militarily numerous times, especially in Nicaragua and Honduras, meaning that the states there were weaker, but left in Nicaragua a really U.S. dominated less elite controlled and more individual personalized dictatorship in the form of Anastasio Somoza. The second period I wanted to look at, and there's a, a small interlude here, which is the Guatemalan Revolution of 1954 that brought into power a progressive government that really wanted to overturn this dependent capitalist repressive notion of progress and follow a different kind of economic model, an economic model based not on the interests of foreign investors and the export economy, but based on the interests of the population. So putting into place a slew of reforms, the revolution takes place in 1944, it's overthrown in 1954, put into place a slew of reforms, including a land reform that confiscated large unused land holdings for distribution to the population, the promotion of labor organizing and peasant organizing, granting new rights to workers, land rights to peasants, exactly the kinds of things that threatened U.S. investors in the case of Guatemala, in particular, the United Fruit Company. But it wasn't just the United Fruit Company that was threatened by the October Revolution in Guatemala. It was also the Guatemalan coffee growing elites who were not Americans, but who were just as threatened by the mobilization of the indigenous workers who they relied on and whose super exploitation they relied on to maintain their profitability. And it was also a Cold War threat 
to the post-war or Cold War economic development model that the United States wanted to impose in Latin America. That this is the second wave of order and progress. And as I'm sure most of you know, the United States organized and trained an exile army and led their invasion of Guatemala, supported with U.S. air power in 1954, overthrew the Guatemalan revolution and put into place a military dictatorship, which essentially has ruled Guatemala until at least the 1990s, if not still today putting Guatemala's military back firmly in control of the country. So the second wave of order and progress economic development is the post-war, Cold War, post-World War II, that is, Cold War wave of development. And after the Guatemalan Revolution, and most especially after the Cuban Revolution of 1959, the United States is very eager to promote itself as the bastion of global democracy and progress and to prove that capitalist economic development is in the interests of poor people, so they should not try to have revolutions against capitalist economic development. So the creation of agencies like the U.S. Agency for International Development, the Peace Corps, the Alliance for Progress, that is this word progress that keeps coming back, that the United States was going to promote economic development in Latin America in order to prevent revolution like the Cuban revolution there. Okay, we went a little too far. We have to promote real economic development now. But their model was pretty much the same old model of export-oriented economic development. That is, we will fund infrastructure to encourage foreign investment and Foreign investment should be the answer to all ills in Central America. Well, in the post-World War II period, a lot of this went into two types of agricultural exports, the promotion of a cotton industry and the promotion of a cattle industry. Now, both of these basically replicated what had happened with coffee and bananas in the 19th century, but on a larger scale. Both of them required a lot of industrial infrastructure, pesticides, fertilizers, slaughterhouses, transportation systems. U.S. aid poured into Central America. They required land. So there was a new round of dispossession and land loss throughout the region. And they required labor, but not enough labor to employ all of the people who were dispossessed and labor on the cotton plantations was even more harsh and toxic than labor on the banana and coffee plantations had been. So economic development was a success in terms of GDP. It was a success in broadening the elites and bringing into the picture more modernizing elites. But from the perspective of Central America's poor, it was precisely the economic development model, the post-war economic development model, the export economies, the coffee, the cotton, and the cattle economies that led to the revolutionary movements that start to organize in the 1960s and 1970s. Now, of course, Central America is not the only place where the post-World War II period brings hopes for liberation of oppressed peoples, whether it's colonized peoples in Africa and Asia, whether it's internally colonized peoples in the United States, African Americans, Native Americans, the Chicano movement, the Central American poor, and the Cuban revolution is a huge inspiration for all of Latin America and also for Latinos in the United States. You're listening to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. On today's program for the KPFA Spring Fun Drive, we are playing excerpts of a fantastic and riveting talk that Professor Aviva Chomsky gave for a KPFA Project Censored Zoom event April 29th. I had the honor of hosting Professor Chomsky that evening. Chomsky expertly recalls in her book and in her talk, Central Americans' valiant struggle for social and economic justice to restore these vivid and gripping events to popular consciousness. 
that talk can be yours. And all of the talks from the spring KPFA lecture series from events, they could all be yours for $150 pledge to support KPFA right now. $150 gets you this special thank you gift. 800-439-5732. KPFA.org. You can look at all the other thank you gifts there and pick one out. But these lecture series are fantastic. As Dennis Bernstein says at Flashpoints, it's KPFA is the university of the airwaves. You know, I utilize a lot of these talks and a lot of the things that go on at KPFA and some of the programming, like Mitch Jezeritz's program. You know, 25 bucks gets you his U.S. history pack. Well, I use this stuff in my classes and introduce my students to KPFA because I'm reminded once upon a time when I was a young person and I stumbled into KPFA, it was like water in the desert. I got to hear so many different ideas and things that I, as a young person, didn't necessarily know about. And so for all the folks out there listening, and especially the ones that have been listening to KPFA for a long time, remember that your donation to KPFA guarantees that somebody else will get to have the opportunity to discover the news that doesn't make the news. They'll get a chance to hear programming that they wouldn't hear anywhere else. That's what you're giving when you donate to KPFA. You're keeping this alive as a vital didactic community resource. It belongs to we the people. 800-439-5732. Please call to support community radio. Go online, kpfa.org. You can pick out whatever you'd like, but for any amount that you donate, you're getting telling the story. Any level you donate, you get telling the story audio collection with Angela Davis, Al Young, Edward Saeed, and also Davey D interviewing Paul Mooney and Dick Gregory. So call now. Any amount gets you telling the story. $150 gets you the whole pack of speakers, Aviva Chomsky, Claudio Sant, and a whole host of others. I hosted those two just this spring alone. Such an amazing lecture series, and it's an honor to host that. And great thanks goes out to Bob Baldock, Ken Preston, and the folks that make that happen here. 800-439-5732. I put out great thanks to our senior producer, Anthony Fest, that puts these shows together. Project Censored on the air over 10 years. We've been around since 1976 doing a book a year. You can learn about us at projectcensored.org. But our mission aligns with the mission of KPFA. And that's why I'm here. And I'm proud and honored to be part of this community. And I thank all of you for the opportunity to be here on the People's Airwaves every week. And we're on 50 other stations around the U.S. And of course, we're online. But... This is where it all started for us on the radio, folks, at KPFA. This is our home. It's your home, too. 800-439-5732. Phone home. (laughs) KPFA.org. This is the place that you're going to hear Aviva Chomsky and Claudio Sant. You're going to hear Al Young. You're going to hear Edward Saeed. You're going to hear Angela Davis. You're going to hear all these people, and you do hear them. We just need you to, if you can, itch in. Any amount gets you telling the story. $150 gets you our amazing set of lectures, right? For $500, you can get the magical history boat tour of the Bay Area. We've got plenty of things to thank you with. And we need to pay the bills here, you know, especially during the pandemic. Everybody has scrambled and picked up. Everybody's pulled weight. And we're still here. And we're an important, vital resource to you now. And we're going to be in the future, but that is contingent upon the support financially of those of you out there that can do it. So those of you that can afford to support KPFA right now, please consider donating what you can. $25 gets you a member. Any amount gets you the telling the story. Thank you gift. $150 gets you the speeches like the one I'm playing today with Professor Aviva Chomsky. What an amazing an iconic figure she is. Of course, the Chomsky family name, no, there are no strangers to the KPFA audience. That's for sure. But unfortunately, people like Aviva Chomsky maybe aren't household names to people that should know about U.S. history in Central America and what's gone on there. And that's what her talk was about. That's what her recent book is about. Central America's Forgotten History. Revolution, Violence, and the Roots of Migration. Aviva Chomsky also examines how and why histories and memories are suppressed and the impact of losing historical memory. 
Only by erasing history can we claim that Central American countries created their own poverty and violence. While the United States' enjoyment and profit from their bananas, coffee, vegetables, clothing, and export of arms are simply unrelated curiosities. No, Chomsky wants us to remember. And she does so in this riveting book and this great talk she gave back in April that I got to host. 150 bucks gets you that and all the talks from this spring series. 800-439-5732. 800-439-5732. We're going to go back now and listen to Aviva Chomsky one more time. Central America's forgotten history. Let's remember it. Revolution violence and the roots of migration. Professor Aviva Chomsky. The Central American poor once again start organizing for a different kind of economy, a different kind of economic development. And now they're thinking as well of a different kind of global economy. That is, the anti-colonial movements are really, after independence, saying we need a new international economic order. We can't continue to be exploited by foreign corporations, by international institutions like the World Bank, the International Development Bank that are putting us into debt, that are forcing us to accept economic systems that work to the benefit of foreign investors, but not to the benefit of our people. So in Guatemala, El Salvador, and Nicaragua, we have these revolutionary movements developing in the 1960s, 1970s, and the Nicaraguan revolution, of course, is triumphant in 1979 and becomes a kind of an inspiration to everybody that is in such a poor country, so dominated by the United States and by the repressive Somoza dictatorship put into place and supported by the United States, a country with practically nothing with high illiteracy rates, with extraordinarily high poverty rates, can not only win a revolution, but can put into practice these revolutionary redistributive measures. And the Nicaraguan revolution, unlike the Cuban revolution, immediately made a commitment to democratic institutions, to organizing elections, to allowing political parties, and to creating a mixed economy. Meanwhile, the Salvadoran Revolution, uh, the FMLN, the Farabundo Marti National Liberation Front, succeeded in taking over large areas of El Salvador's territory. They never overthrew the government, but they did establish essentially a revolutionary state within a state. That is, areas that were simply not under government control, but where the FMLN became the government and organized services like schools and health clinics. And the inspiration of mobilized people with nothing, being able to create the new world and the new economy and the new society was truly inspirational um, around the world. It was also met with extraordinarily heavy repression, especially in Guatemala, where hundreds of thousands were killed, disappeared, displaced. Hundreds of villages were simply destroyed and wiped off the map. And in Guatemala, the counter-revolution had the added twist of Guatemalan racism, very particularly vicious kind of racism against indigenous people. Guatemala also had the largest indigenous population of the Central American countries. I can talk more about that in the questions if you want. But vicious repression in all three countries sponsored by the United States. That is, the United States simply defined all of these revolutions as communist and organized the Contra War to overthrow the government of Nicaragua, completely ignoring the elections in 1984 that the Sandinistas won, and to help the governments of El Salvador and Guatemala crush the revolutionary movements in those countries. Some congressional opposition forced the Reagan administration to go underground with a lot of this. Israel became a conduit for U.S. aid to Guatemala. You all know about the Iran-Contra affair, a lot of covert funding of the Contras and trying to work around and pressuring Congress. So in 1990, the Sandinistas lost the 1990 election. 
under huge threat from the United States, which made it extremely clear that if the Sandinistas won this election too, the war would continue. And in 1992, the peace treaty was signed in El Salvador in 1996 in Guatemala. Now, the signing of the peace treaties made some political changes in El Salvador and Guatemala, opened the political system, established certain democratic institutions, allowed the revolutionary movements to participate in politics, to lay down their arms and to be reorganized as political parties and participate in the political system. But the peace treaties really did not challenge the social and economic causes of the revolution, the highly skewed land systems, the extraordinary poverty, the lack of rights of the poor, the very things that had caused the revolutions were not addressed in the peace treaties. Instead, the peace treaties opened the door to a full-fledged neoliberal assault on Central America from the United States. The negotiation of the new free trade agreement, CAFTA, and the wholesale imposition of the late 20th century third wave of progress under U.S. auspices. And the new export economy that the United States, foreign investment export economy um, that the United States had in mind for Central America in the late 1990s and into the 2000s was based on a somewhat different set of economic activities. CAFTA opened the door to the maquiladora sector in Central America. And if you choose to examine the labels on the clothes that you're wearing right now, I would guess that probably 90% of the people who are listening to this have a label somewhere in their clothes that says made in El Salvador, made in Honduras, made in Nicaragua, made in Guatemala. So the maquiladora sector, which is also connected to the neoliberal restructuring deindustrialization of the United States that is opening Central America as a place that U.S. factories can go to escape the regulated labor market, the minimum wages, the health and safety regulations, the environmental regulations that they were subject to in the United States to escape all of this into a sort of investor's paradise in Central America. The new neoliberal economy was also based on tourism, again, in the hands of foreign investors and for the benefit of U.S. and European tourists. It was based on extractivism. That is a huge push for mega projects, especially in mining and energy sectors, That is, now that the wars were over, all of the land had been opened up for foreign investment. Also, new agro-export crops. And again, if you look in your refrigerator or in your fruit basket, you'll find that it's not only bananas and coffee that come from Central America now. It's broccoli and snap peas and all kinds of unexpected fruits and vegetables that you find on the supermarket shelves come from Central America. And also some invisible agro-export products. One of the biggest one is oil palm, palm oil, African palm, huge plantations that are used not only in manufacturing palm oil in, in practically every kind of processed food that if you have anything that comes in a package, one of the ingredients with the list of ingredients, one of them will be palm oil, but even more so as an alternative source of energy that is, as an ingredient in gasoline. So all this talk about green energy, a lot of it relies on very repressive and dirty extractive and productive systems, much of it in the third world, whether it's lithium for your batteries or ethanol for your car. These don't come from nowhere. They come from the land and labor of Latin Americans. So this is the new export economy that has been put into place and like the earlier two export economies has required a large degree of violence to maintain and to crush popular resistance of which there is still a lot in Central America, especially to extractivism. So peace and neoliberalism, I would say, 
in many ways is the root cause of all of the things that Kamala Harris said were the problems that are causing migration out of Central America. Poverty, violence, corruption, drought, hurricanes, and climate change. Just one other piece of the drought and hurricanes is that as the productive lands are taken over more and more by export agriculture, poor people are pushed more and more into unproductive lands, which are more susceptible to drought and hurricane. In addition to, of course, the United States being the major emitter of CO2 and thus the cause of climate change that contributes to extreme weather events. So I wanted to end by looking at the policies that our political leaders are now putting into place. They claim that they're going to start a new era of collaboration and being good neighbors once again to Central America. And yet what Biden and Harris are proposing looks very much like the same old economic development model that has caused all of Central America's problems. President Biden proposed his plan for security and prosperity in Central America and promised $4 billion over four years to promote security and prosperity. Now, those two words might sound kind of nice, but in the history of Central America, and perhaps in the history of the United States, security means military and police. Security means arms. Security means security for some through the repression of others. And a lot of this security is actually going to border security. That is, President Biden wants to expand something that he began as vice president during the Obama administration, the second Obama presidency, the militarization of Mexico's southern border. And Biden is now expanding this to the militarization of Guatemala's southern border, the militarization of the interior of Guatemala, and even the militarization of Honduras's southern border and the interior of Honduras to prevent migrants from leaving. So security, but security for whom? When we send military aid to Central America, it's pretty clear who the beneficiaries and who the victims are going to be. Prosperity, well, the United States has one vision of prosperity, and that is inviting in foreign investment, export-oriented production in the hands of foreign investors. So lots of aid has gone to Central America over the last 60 years. 60, 70, 80 years. But all of the aid has gone to promote the very model of economic development that relies on and perpetuates poverty for the majority of Central Americans. Furthermore, some of the aid is conditioned on security cooperation. In a really heinous move a few weeks ago, Biden offered a paltry number of vaccines out of the U.S. surplus to Mexico in exchange for Mexican promises to collaborate with the United States on its anti-migration agenda. Speaking with the Guatemalan president, Vice President Harris promised the first $310 million, but that was conditioned on the creation of a joint border task force that is going to send U.S. DHS officials to Guatemala's southern border to work with and train some of the 7,000 Guatemalan troops and the 12 new internal checkpoints in Guatemala to prevent migration. So I thought I would just end with a statement by State Department spokesperson Jen Psaki, who summarized the new administration's policy by saying, The objective is to make it more difficult to make the journey. This does not define a humane immigration policy. They like to talk about the crisis at the border. They want to get rid of the crisis at the border by pushing the crisis back into Central America. They don't want to acknowledge the history, but I do.
You're tuned to the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. Today's program for the KPFA Fall Fun Drive, I've been sharing with you excerpts of a talk given by Professor Aviva Chomsky. She was talking about her book, Central America's Forgotten History, Revolution, Violence, and the Roots of Migration. This talk and all the talks from the Spring Series are available to you for a $150 pledge right now by calling 800-439-5732. KPFA.org. 800, hey, KPFA. Love to see the phones lighting up and to see your support during the Project Censored Show Hour. It shows that you're listening not only to KPFA, but you listen to this show. This hour, we've been playing Aviva Chomsky's Central America's Forgotten History, Revolution, Violence, and the Roots of Migration. $150 gets you that and the other talks, eight different talks, just from this spring. You can get the Malcolm X Digital Collection, you can get the Magical History Boat Tour for $500. But for any amount you donate, any amount, any donor, will get the special thank you of Telling the Story, Angela Davis, Al Young, Paul Mooney, Dick Gregory. Any amount gets you that gift. Thank you, thank you for supporting KPFA. Thank you for helping us keep this dream alive over 70 years, going back to 1949. We're a vital resource of the community. You know it. If you can support us, now's the time to do it. We'll be doing this for another week. 800-439-5732. And keep this station and keep truth-telling alive. We need it desperately. In the world of corporate media noise and in all of the din, KPFA cuts through. Please help us to keep cutting through. 800-439-5732. That's what you can do. KPFA.org. Very grateful to be here. Very grateful that you're all tuned in. And we will see you next time. Today's show has been Aviva Chomsky. Central America's Forgotten History, Revolution, Violence, and the Roots of Migration. Coming up here next month, stay tuned for fresh Project Censored shows. We've got some great ones coming up. More of our partnership with the Real News Network. A lot of things in the works, folks. But again, keep the calls coming. 800-439-5732. KPFA.org. I'm Nikki Huff for the Project Censored Show. This is Pacifica Radio. Thank you for supporting KPFA. KPFA's digital delivery system offers you incentives to donate with instant payback. We're curating our high-impact independent journalism, the voices that need to be heard. At kpfa.org, view our digital collections for this spring drive. The Malcolm X and Alan Watts Collection, Letters and Politics U.S. History Collection, and Philosophy and the Good Life from Against the Grain. Support storytelling for social change by donating today at kpfa.org. KPFA has gone social. Media, that is. Stay connected to all things KPFA by visiting our Facebook and Twitter pages, where you'll be able to get special access to additional news and information from all of your favorite KPFA news and music programs. And make sure to check out KPFA's YouTube channel for never-seen-before musical performances and past KPFA author events. KPFA knows this is your station, and we want you to feel connected to us at all times so we can all continue to stay vigilant as always. Hi, this is Chris Hedges. When I'm in Berkeley, I always listen to KPFA because I do not want my news and information given to me through the lens of corporate power. KPFA is an absolutely vital organization within your community, one that keeps journalism alive and gives voice to those who otherwise would have no voice. Please donate what you can today. Hi, this is Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz. In these difficult times, I cannot imagine living in this world without KPFA. 
We must support KPFA. Please donate what you can today. Thank you. Donate today at kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org.